So welcome to the second of our three webinars. This is Planning and Saving for the Future. As you know, November is Financial Literacy Month. And for this November, we are focusing on providing Canadians with education to help them better manage their finances. So the information we are providing is aimed at ordinary Canadians or for those advising ordinary Canadians. And our aim is to help improve the livelihood of every Canadian by providing insights into their financial management. Today's webinar is being recorded and a recording will be available afterwards. Any financial reporting analysis, projections, or other observations must be construed solely as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities. We ask that no one record this webinar without CSI's explicit written permission. And lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made or questions asked by the webinar audience. So please note that this presentation is being offered by CSI, a Moody's analytics company, which operates independently of Moody's Investor Services, the credit rating agency. So for optimal listening, all our attendees are currently on mute. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A box at the lower right-hand corner of the webinar presentation screen. So it's my pleasure now to introduce the host for this session, John Pappas. John leads the business development team at CSI, as well as the learning and support team around the globe at Moody's Analytics. Prior to joining CSI, John worked in various capacities in the financial services industry for 20 years as an economist, uh, investment advisor, account executive, and market trader. John will be moderating, moderating the panel and handling the questions from our audience. So let me turn the session over to John. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for that uh, really terrific inter introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody who has joined as an attendee. Good morning if you're on the West Coast and uh, good evening if you happen to be located elsewhere other than Eastern Time. Uh, it's my pleasure to host this webinar for today. We have with us a terrific expert panel from various financial institutions in Canada. I would like to introduce all these people to you. At this point, from CIBC, we have Carissa Lucrenziano, who is Vice President of Financial Planning. From Sun Life Financial, we have James Bilcox, Certified Financial Planner. And from HSBC, we have Archie Pedden, who is a Wealth Planner. The format of today's webinar will be as follows. Uh, there will be three key questions that we will ask of the expert panel throughout the webinar, uh, starting, starting off with uh, uh, each individual and then opening it up to the rest of the panel. Uh, for the attendees, feel free to ask questions throughout in the question box. We will try and uh, get to as many of them uh, as we possibly can in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. Uh, each component of the three questions that I mentioned, we will try and keep to about 10 to 15 minutes for each of the panelists to respond to. So moving on to the first question, I will direct it to Carissa. Carissa, why is it important to set financial goals and objectives? Thanks so much, John. Happy to be here today. And I think your question is a very, very important one. It is such a pivotal time to obtain advice about financial goals and revisit or create a solid plan to reach them. The COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 has really taught us the importance of security, having a safety net, and the power of having a financial plan to weather in certain times. And having a solid uh, plan could be the difference between bouncing back quicker than unexpected. You know, a recent CIBC poll found that 40% of Canadians are worried about the impacts of the pandemic on their retirement plans. And almost a quarter have been unable to contribute to their retirement plans since the pandemic began. You know, good news also is that the, you know, the poll revealed uh, some top lessons that Canadians have learned. And, you know, there's uh, three that I want to highlight. One, uh, that they need to pay more attention to personal finances. Uh, number two, not to panic when markets get volatile. And three, how important it is to save for retirement and the future. 
So it really comes down to good planning, John. Uh, we all have dreams and things that we hope to achieve by a certain age uh, or a certain point of our life, but uh, without a solid plan to get there, it's really difficult to, to bring those plans and dreams to life. Uh, one needs to set achievable financial goals and have a plan to reach them and implement them in order to make dreams become a reality. So now setting financial goals and objectives is important, but you, uh, you, you need to do so uh, in, uh, to understand um, you know, your cash flow, cash flow first. For those who tuned into the first webinar of this series, uh, you'll recall the importance of understanding cash flow and the steps to go about by tracking it. Being confident about managing your cash flow is important before you start planning for your goals. So we're going to get right into it and I'm going to go through a couple of steps uh, just on the topic of setting goals. So uh, what are, you know, your goals and, and how important it is to identify them? And once you, you really understand and track your, uh, your cash flow, you can begin to think about these goals. And this is the really fun part. It's the exciting part. And you can just start off with thinking, you know, what, what do I want to accomplish in the next one year, three five, 10. Uh, what am I going to be doing in 20 years, 30 years? Uh, what do I want to achieve? Will you be, uh, do you want to purchase your first home or do you want to purchase a vehicle? Do you want to pay for your children's post-secondary education? Do you want to renovate your home, which is a, a very hot topic these days, or do you want to plan uh, your next big vacation? Um, do you want to retire comfortably and share your wealth with charities that are close to your heart? So these are just some of the ideas. There's many, many questions we can ask ourselves, uh, but these are just some of the fun ways we can start thinking about what prioritizing our goals. And hopefully these ideas get you started and get you thinking about it. Um, you know, the key is to pinpoint, you know, when you want to achieve each goal, that's very important, and how much it will cost to reach them. This brings us to step two, refining and categorizing your goals. So how do you turn them into reality? When refining your goals, it's really important to use the SMART principle. And I'll go through what that means uh, in detail. So S uh, stands for specific. In order to set goals that you can actually achieve, it's important to make them as specific as possible. So something simple like purchasing a vehicle, is it going to be a new vehicle, a pre-owned vehicle? Will it have warranty? Will it not? Just to start to understand what will factor into the cost. And that's where we go to the next is M that stands for measurable. Think about how much it's going to cost to fund that goal. If it's a vacation, for example, consider costs like transportation, food, entertainment, and souvenirs. You should also factor some ex excess funds for some unexpected emergencies or unplanned uh, events that if you have to stay in a hotel an extra night if your plane is delayed, stuff like that. Um, a stands for achievable and R stands for realistic. For goals to be achievable and realistic, uh, they, they shouldn't be too large of a stretch from where you are today or else, you know, there's a chance you'll become discouraged uh, that you're not making progress towards those goals. By working with an advisor, they can help you determine goals that are achievable and realistic for your budget and for your time horizon. And lastly, T stands for time bound. And the more specific you can get with your goals, the better. By establishing a set date you want to achieve your goal by, it'll allow you to plan to fund for it. And so, you know, goals can be categorized into three kind of areas, short term, medium term, and long term. Uh, short term is goals usually realized within two years or less, medium term, three to five years, and long term, six years or more. So uh, also keep in mind that your goals are a reflection of your current wants and needs. And those, chain, those uh, goals will change over time and uh, they'll likely evolve with you. And that's, and that's a normal course when, uh, when revisiting you know, over year over year. Uh, once you've established and, and you have clear goals, it's really good to write them down. So whether it is a vision board, so you can put images on a vision board, whether that's virtually or you can do that you know, just um, manually as well, um, it's really good to see these goals because you'll be able to revisit them uh, almost every day if you like uh, to make sure that you hold yourself accountable. Even writing a simple list also works. So moving on to step three, determining the best method to fund your goals. So in order to reach your financial goals, you have to save and you also have to invest. In step two, when we identify the time horizon and cost to achieving goals, um, you know, this, this will make sure that you, you determine the best way to save for them. For example, if you're saving for an emergency fund or a major purchase within one to two years, you'll wanna focus on building your savings and keeping your money protected and easily accessible. 
let's start at looking some for uh, through some short term savings and investment options. Example could be saving for a new vehicle, a vacation, a home renovation. And when funding short term goals, you want to keep money secured and, you know, with some reasonable growth for the short time frame. Of course, every situation is different and uh, you're going to want to make sure that you are you are really understanding what your goals, uh, what your goals are, the time frame in order to achieve them. So uh, when we look at different types of strategies for savings, uh, programs include things like registered retirement savings plans, RRSPs, what they're known by, uh, registered education savings plans, that's RESPs. There's also registered disability savings plans, RDSPs, and tax-free savings accounts. TFSAs. So these are strategies that you can implement to save uh, for a short, medium, or long-term goal. And next, James is going to discuss the types of investments to consider based on your goals and some of these strategies. So keep in mind that some investments can be very complex and some can also be quite risky, which is why it's really important to understand your risk tolerance and your level and your time horizon so you're comfortable with it. It may be tempting to choose investments that offer the potential for the highest rate of return, but the trade-off is additional risk. Uh, for that, the higher level of risk may be acceptable if your goal is longer term, because you may have more time to recover from any financial losses. Ultimately, it's very important to speak with an advisor or an investment professional uh, to determine whether the investments uh, that you're thinking about or, or recommended are, are right for your time horizon and risk tolerance. And lastly, if you're saving for a medium term goal, like a purchase uh, of a, your home or vacation property, the saving strategy will uh, be based on your unique situation. So again, best to work with an advisor. Uh, if we go to um, the next slide, so saving uh, early, um, this is the last step when setting your financial goals and objectives, and it really is to start uh, the savings process. Once you've established the best savings vehicle and investment for your goals, you can put them into action. You may want to work with an advisor to establish a regular savings plan or automatic, automatic savings that directs funds regularly from your checking account to your savings account. And so uh, the slide that you're seeing in front of you, what it really uh, shows is uh, the long-term effects of savings. So uh, investing just $50 a month could grow close to $50,000 in 30 years. Now, this is based on a, you know, an assumption of 6% over a set amount of time. And you can, there's very, there's various variables that you can implement, but the main uh, point here is that when you invest regularly over time, uh, there is uh, an opportunity to save and save for the future. Um, so when the transfer of savings is automated, as mentioned, it can help you secure and save that money rather than it being spent on the spur of the moment. And uh, after that, you're all set. You know, be patient, check in regularly to see how you're progressing towards your goals. And also remember that life happens and unexpected events may cause your cash flow to change. We've all been through, a, you know, we're all going through a really tough year. Um, also, timelines uh, may increase. This is normal and it doesn't mean that you're, uh, you need to abandon your goals. It doesn't mean uh, that you won't reach them. It just means that you may need to make some adjustments and some considerations. An advisor can help you reevaluate your plans and get you back on track if you have, if you're off track. And also looking at your goals each and every year as mentioned at minimum is very, very important. And uh, remember your goals again may change based on life circumstances. So um, some things may become bigger priority uh, than they were a year, two or five years ago. So just be open to evolving your goals along with you. So to recap, when setting financial goals, you will want to think about and you'll really need to, number one, identify them. Uh, number two, refine them in terms of the dollar value and time horizon. And then three, determine the best method to fund them, taking into account your time horizon and risk tolerance. Start the savings process as soon as you can, reviewing and adjusting as needed. And, you know, employing these tips are how you will turn your uh, greatest goals uh, and dreams into uh, reality. So thanks, John. Thank you, Carissa, for that, that very, very detailed answer. Um, I will ask the rest of the panelists, I will open it up at this point uh, for their view. Uh, I will ask James first. Uh, James, the question was, why is it important to set financial goals and objectives? 
Well, I like um, what, what Carissa talked about, uh, a thorough job there. And I would say, you know, in my practice, it's starting with cash flow as well. So she talked about that, um, getting a sense of inflow, outflow, optimizing it, uh, having a strategy there to be, you know, articulate with uh, your goals as, as best you can. Uh, extend grace to yourself in that process. It is a, it is a journey. Um, your, your helpers in your life, your, your financial professionals can, can help you kind of begin to articulate that and draft that as it evolves, be flexible with that. As she, as Chris was saying, you know, life is dynamic. And so your goals will, and your needs will change. And, uh, you know, from a financial planning perspective, we're always working backwards from, from those goals to try and identify opportunities and gaps and close those gaps for our clients. So it's very important. Great. Thank you for that, James. Archie, do you have a view? Yeah, I would just say you have to be realistic with the goals that you set for yourself. And uh, really it's articulating your short and long-term goals and then prioritizing them um, as the ones that are most important to you. You really need to set a target date as to when you'd like to achieve them. But I think it really helps to work with a financial planner or financial advisor to help you uh, reach all of those goals, whether they be short-term or long-term. Now, don't try to do it all on your own um, because really that's, that's what financial experts are there for. Good advice for advice. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question at this point. The next question is, why is it important to have an understanding of the types of products and services available? I will call on James for an initial response. Awesome. First off, thank you to CSI for uh, having me on as a panelist. And thank you to all the attendees that uh, have decided to engage uh, Financial Literacy Month here with CSI. Um, number one, uh, it's important because knowledge is power. It's your life, it's your plan, whether you are a do-it-yourselfer or whether you seek out collaboration and partnership with a trusted financial professional. As a retail consumer of services and solutions available in the Canadian financial services industry, it's important to, to have a baseline awareness and understanding of what is out there, mainly so that you are empowered to ask the right questions of your financial institution and advisor and to improve your own judgment and discernment about what is the right set of services and solutions for your unique situation at a given time in your life. So I'd argue greater awareness leads to the formulation of better questions. As your needs change, the services and solutions you will need will evolve as well. The demand, your, your demand, your questions and your needs will drive further innovation in the financial services industry. The financial services industry is so vast. There's different pillars uh, from banks to trust companies to brokerages and wealth boutiques to insurance providers, discount brokers, independent advisors, and many more. There are so many different services and solutions out there. Uh, and there are many different unique value propositions uh, amongst the professional advisor community and accreditations and expertise. So it's important for you to have a sense of what questions to ask your advisors so that you can make good decisions. During my uh, time in financial services, there's been an incredible wave of innovation and change. It's important to stay up to speed on major developments and innovations that could help you. And we've seen a number of changes even in 2020 with respect to tax laws uh, and government policy initiatives that change over time. And that means products and financial strategies will go through nuanced uh, changes as well over time. Lastly, for those of us who are parents or who will be soon, we must become empowered in, in our own financial literacy so that we can educate and transfer values to our own children as well. In my opinion, a transfer of values should precede a transfer of wealth to the next generation. Anecdotally, I've noticed that the stewards of successfully executed fa uh, family wealth plans were intentional over time to educate their children and the next stewards. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Archie, I will ask you to respond to this question. Why is it important to have an understanding of the types of products and services available in the marketplace. I think, uh, thanks, John. Um, today, I think, you know, it's a very complex uh, environment in terms of the products and services that are available and to have a deep understanding. Uh, you really need to either educate yourself or have a financial expert educate you. Um, you don't want to get into a situation where you're in an investment that doesn't really match the specific goal at hand, whether it be a short-term goal or a long-term goal um, and having a deeper understanding of the risk levels involved with those products um, will help you, know, help you attain those goals um, long-term and not 
um, have missteps along the way. Very good. Thank you. Carissa, being with a very large banking institution in Canada, uh, I'm certain that you would have a view on this as well. Yeah, to, uh, I guess, just to build on James and Archie's uh, comments there, um, you know, there's, according to the Canadian Bankers Association, there's over 40 institutions that provide uh, financial, financial services and financial products. So it's really, really important uh, to really understand, uh, you know, the, the, the products that are being presented to you. So there's a lot of choice out there for sure. And James and Archie also talked a lot about financial literacy. So uh, I would say, you know, threefold is one, find the right match, find the right match in terms of investments that suits your needs. So there is not a one size fits all. Uh, there's tons of solutions out there that uh, are, will, will align to your specific goals. Uh, really understand the risks associated with each investment. So uh, your, um, your financial advisor, financial professional, um, you know, ask, uh, ask a lot of questions, really ensure that you understand understand uh, the uh, the products again risk associated and number three most important and uh, James and Archie spoke a lot about it is is seek out professional advice sit with a professional talk to a professional um, you know the the investment side is the result of a well thought out goals and plan uh, goals and planning so at, you know after the due diligence of, of the goal setting and uh, reviewing the plan is when you know you implement uh, the investment strategy. So I would say really understanding the goals and the path uh, is is really important to connect to the investments that are going to be made. I have a, uh, thank you, Carissa. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a question here from one of the attendees and it is product specific. And the question is pretty straightforward. How would I know if a mutual fund has a management fee or not? Anybody can take that. I'll, I'll step in here. Um, all the, uh, the mutual fund industry provide a prospectus that would outline what the, the fees are associated with mutual funds. And they actually, it's a regulatory requirement for them to provide a prospectus for all the mutual funds that they offer. Um, so you can usually find it on their website. They, uh, they used to send them in the mail. If you owned a mutual fund, they would send them in the mail sometimes once a year or quarterly, but now that we don't do snail mail anymore, a lot of it's digital. So you know, if you, if you can't find it online from the mutual fund or the financial institution that's offering it, you can definitely, uh, you know, ask the advisor or, or financial institution that you work with, and they will definitely uh, send you a PDF probably of the, uh, the particular fund and its associated management fee. So typically, just to summarize a prospectus, a website, or your advisor, or the financial institution you do business with should have that information readily available. Very good. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to our next question. This question is for you, Archie, to kick off. Uh, the question is, what is the financial planning pyramid and what are some of the different strategies to save for the future? Okay. Uh, thanks, John. And thanks to CSI and Moody's for inviting me as a panelist today. Um, the financial planning pyramid, I, I quite often will use it as a tool with uh, my clients um, and, and it really, really helps you map out, um, you know, basically managing your personal finances. And when I think of a pyramid, I, I think of Egypt and all the different se several layers with starting with a solid foundation and working our way up to the top um, in terms of, you know, financial progression. Um, you know, in the early years, you're in the protection phase and then as time goes on, um, you're hoping to achieve financial freedom or financial independence at the top and then eventually distributing your wealth. Um, so it really just provides a nice visual aid um, to help create that financial plan, which a lot of Canadians haven't actually taken the time to do. So if we start at the bottom on the protection piece, um, usually once we start working in life at a young age, if we're able to get a job, at an early age, we, the first thing you might have is some student debt that you'll need to pay off. So debt reduction becomes a, a strategy at first. And then normally I recommend clients, you know, they'd want to de develop an emergency fund. And it's kind of a contingency that if the apple cart tips, we have money set aside to cover three to six months of living expenses. Um, and also part of the protection piece is life insurance, uh, disability insurance and critical illness. 
Um, normally at this stage, you might have debt or you might have um, dependents that require income replacement. If you suffer from um, some health issues, um, you need to have some uh, insurance coverage set aside to cover those um, short-term needs. Um, so it doesn't derail you from uh, protecting uh, your loved ones, but also your income. And as part of protection, um, you need to set up um, a last will and testament. So 50% of Canadians don't have an actual estate plan. They haven't actually taken the time to have a legally drafted will. Um, and on top of the will, equally important is the power of attorney documents for if you become incapacitated and you can no longer speak for yourself and you need to, uh, you need to assign someone to do that for you if you're incapacitated. Um, next, moving up the pyramid to the regular savings, um, we look at creating a budget. So you want to maintain a pos positive cash flow. You want to be um, not spending more than what you're earning. Um, you also want to make sure as part of this phase, um, as Carissa mentioned, home ownership becomes a priority for a lot of Canadians. So coming up with that down payment would be one of the goals in the short running um, to achieve that five, a minimum 5% of the down payment, but preferably 20% of the down payment. Um, but then also what, what is required to actually qualify for the mortgage, you know, meeting with your, your financial institution to figure out, um, you know, whether that's even possible and at what point that might occur. Um, Carissa and James mentioned RSPs and TFSAs. This is where you'd want to set up those accounts to start saving for retirement. Um, as you mentioned, the time value of money is so crucial. So starting at a young age is, is so important. Um, I always mention the rule of 50-30-20. Um, so the 50-30-20 rule is 50% should go towards your basic expenditures for lifestyle, 30% for discretionary, and 20% for paying down debt, but also for saving for, the, for retirement. Um, so the next phase up is growth and diversification. <clears throat> so this is a phase where you're normally juggling a balancing act of saving for retirement, paying down debt. Possibly if you have children, you might be starting to save more in the RESP towards their post-secondary education. So it becomes a very uh, stressful period because you're balancing all of those different savings efforts. Um, at this point too, you're actually able to diversify your holdings, maybe not just into mutual funds, but other investment opportunities, whether they be individual equities, individual bonds, and Really at this stage, you're, re you're hopefully you're progressing in your career and your, your income has gone up um, and you actually have more disposable income that you can actually put into those other types of investments. So there's a plethora of investment options out there and you may need a financial expert, as I mentioned, to guide you with those investment options. And the next phase is- Archie, yeah. sorry to interrupt your train of thought. Uh, if I could just ask, there seems to be some noise on the line. If I could ask all the attendees to please uh, mute their microphones as it's, uh, it's a little bit distracting. Um, so if you don't mind, um, please, uh, please mute your channel so that uh, we can hear Archie very, very clearly. Sorry about that, Archie. I just wanted to mention that. No problem. Thanks, John. Yeah, so in the next phase, basically, you're hopefully have achieved your financial freedom um, at the speculation or living in retirement phase. So um, financial independence means many things to different people. But I guess at that point, you know, you, you have the luxury that you don't if you don't want to work or you don't have you don't want to have to work. Some people envision it as reaching a milestone and then hitting the golf course. For others, it might be continuing to do what they their passion is, which is working at their profession, even into retirement or maybe a more gradual retirement rather than cold turkey. Um, and with that, others might be more about volunteering their time. Um, maybe it's to a specific charity that's important to them. Um, but at this point, basically we're, we're establishing, we have enough retirement assets that we can say, okay, we have enough now and I can live off of my retirement assets. So really it's about creating cash flow. You know, when I do wealth plans, I have quite often ask client, Clients will tell me, well, I want to create a monthly cash flow. So we want to make it tax efficient cash flow for them on a monthly basis. Um, it's also a phase where they have a base of protection for the retirement assets. They're going to meet all the retirement needs. But at this stage, they can also take a portion of their wealth and put it into speculation investments to try to grow their wealth um, to even a higher level um, because they have the freedom uh, of, of having the wealth to be able to do that. 
And then the final phase is the wealth distribution phase. Um, this might be at a point where you're kind of separating out again, you know, here's a portion of my wealth that will cover my retirement needs for life. But there's this other portion that I could potentially gift to my children or grandchildren um, rather than me waiting until I die at age 95, you know, my children or my grandchildren could benefit from this money. So this could be for a number of things. It could be for wedding costs. It could be for a first down payment on a home for um, children or, or grandchildren, post-secondary education, buying a car, uh, contributing to grandchildren's RESP, uh, gifting for tax-free savings accounts contributions. Um, also at this stage with uh, anyone who's self-employed might be the transfer of a business. So succession planning, you know, how, how is that gonna occur? And when is that gonna occur? Um, what would be the steps to get there to transfer that business on? And finally, um, in terms of the estate planning piece, I talked about that at the protection piece, but at the top of the pyramid, we definitely wanna review our estate plan and make sure it matches our current wishes. Um, because as, as time goes by, obviously that will change in time. And you know, for a lot of people at this stage, they wanna minimize income taxes on their estate, but also minimize probate fees. And um, they also need to think about their long-term care needs, which is um, really an issue with the COVID uh, pandemic that we're facing right now. Um, obviously that's an area of discussion and definitely in terms of planning. Um, so moving on to the next slide, John. Uh, one quick question here, Archie. I have a question from an attendee, uh, but I perhaps I missed the reference. Um, the question is, can you repeat the 50, 30, 20 again? Sure. Yeah, so 50% would be for basic lifestyle expenditures, which are fixed costs. Um, you know, it might be gas for your car, your utilities on a monthly basis. Um, and then 30% is for discretionary items. Now, what's ironic with that is I would consider discretionary item to be an Apple iPhone. Um, discretionary items would also be like shopping for extravagant items, um, could be travel um, outside the realm. So these would be 30% towards those discretionary items. Dining out is another one. Um, and then finally, 20%. Um, towards dedicated savings plan, where you're actually putting, setting money aside for retirement savings. Um, and included in that 20% would also be paying down debt. So that could be a mortgage on a home or it could be student debt. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, this slide basically, I wanted to highlight on the left side, the different strategies at a very high level, um, how to save for the future. Um, so starting number bullet point number one, uh, spend less than you earn uh, quite often. Um, you know, if you don't have a budget in place, um, you're really just living um, month to month and not really paying attention to how much after tax money is coming into you from your earnings um, and then not tracking your spending. Um, you know, you could fall into a pitfall there and you just need to make sure that there's positive cash flow there. Um, list your goals. Um, so all your short-term and long-term goals um, that Carissa mentioned. Um, it's crucial to, you know, have a plan in place, put down what your goals are, prioritize them, set a target date, and then work towards saving towards each of those goals with a different investment strategy. Um, you really have to create the habit. Um, and I always say there's a complacency in this area. People will say, well, I'll just do it tomorrow but you really need to take the bull by the horns and start saving today. Um, we already saw the graph of the time value of money um, and starting to save early. So, you know, when you're in your twenties and you're working, you just don't want to be spending it all. You want to be putting a saving strategy in place. Um, and the best way to do that, if, if you don't have an employment um, defined contribution plan or a, be lucky enough to have a public pension plan, you really need to look at self, you know, paying yourself first and have a monthly contribution to an RRSP or tax-free savings account um, or even a non-registered account for that matter. Um, but basically you're, you're committing to that plan and, and sticking with it. Um, you know, quite often there'll be people start a monthly plan, but then they'll find that their bank account goes into the red. So they'll stop that monthly contribution. Um, but you really need to stay committed, you know, work through your budget, remove some of the discretionary items that you might be spending money on and dedicate that towards savings. Um, delay gratification. So quite often clients will get into a bind where they get attracted by buying a luxury car, a boat, uh, maybe a too big a home. 
and suddenly they find themselves swimming in debt. So I would just say that, you know, get to a point in your life where you actually have the wealth to be able to buy those big ticket items and delay all of those big ticket items that are going to put you um, in a negative position. Um, and finally, the last three here are really grouped in together. You know, you want to choose an investment that matches your current risk tolerance, um, but also your return objectives. But it also is able to achieve the required rate of return you need going forward to meet that goal. Um, and on the right side, I'm not going to get into too much detail on all these items, but um, Carissa and James talked about them already, but you know, the registered plans that the government offers, the RSP, TFSA, RESP, uh, work pensions. Um, quite often I'll see clients, they'll achieve their wealth through real estate, whether they be rental properties or even secondary or co cottages or other properties. Um, there's a million dollar small, sorry, a million small businesses in Canada. So, you know, it's definitely an area to create wealth as well. Um, you know, our economy in Canada's, um, it's the backbone of this country's economy, the small business area. Um, stock options, you know, if you have the luxury of working for a large cap company that offers stock options <clears throat> as part of their employment, you um, should definitely take advantage of those um, cash incentives um, as part of your uh, compensation. And then I won't get into too much detail on, on the investment options, but you know, as I mentioned, there's a plethora of different investment options with different risk tolerances and different return objectives. And you really need to sit down with a financial expert to really go through which ones are applicable to your situation and the particular goal at hand. And that's my part. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. I seem to be having a little bit of trouble with my video connection here. I hope everybody can still hear me. Um, we want to continue on this question and I'll pass it over to James at this point. Uh, James, the question was, what is the financial planning pyramid and what are some of the different strategies to save for the future? Okay. Um, well, I think Archie did a really good job of covering off the financial planning pyramid there and, uh, some of the common strategies. So I'll, I'll, I'll let that rest, but I, I think there was a, there was kind of a dovetail into government and workplace savings plans and what, uh, the retail consumer should be you know, aware of. For sure, it is very important to get a good handle on the various government and employer-sponsored savings plans out there. I do a lot of consultative work with clients uh, that are part of an employer plan. Um, and there's lots of amazing questions that come through day to day. Um, so given a, a specific set of goals, there's almost always an existing government or employer-sponsored savings plan program to match up with it strategically. And uh, as the slide dictates here, uh, there's, there's a flavor for every saver, as I, as I said. Um, so when often when I illustrate it to folks in, in person, uh, I'll use like a, literally a coffee mug to illustrate the different, different buckets or, or compartmentalization of, of these. But uh, without getting to super detail, uh, there's a ton of generosity and incentives offered to Canadians through government savings initiatives, as well as for employees who use workplace plans. And I, can, I guess my comment is, is uh, we don't always take full advantage. And I think Archie alluded to that as well. And, and we should try to optimize uh, these, these matching programs that are offered um, inside the constraints of our cash flow and our priorities. Um, RSPs, really quickly, there's a tax incentive when you drop dollars into the RSP bucket. And uh, every year, you, as you have earnings, you'll, you'll attain new uh, contribution room. Uh, there's also a tax deferral on the growth of your investments. And, and the hope is, is that you build up retirement security as part of a total equation here to, to draw out income in the future, perhaps hopefully when you're at a lower tax bracket. Tax-free savings accounts. Um, I think also just to note on RSPs, I think Archie did talk about it, home buyers plan, lifelong learning plan. I would invite questions about that in the Q&A. Uh, the TFSAs are, are a fantastic vehicle that were introduced in 2009. If you've been eligible for this whole time, um, the accumulated room is something like 69,500. So it's actually turning into a significant amount of capital that you can uh, begin to save and invest. You can even start, uh, start with a small amount and kind of build from there. Um, and so tax-free investments, that's huge. And so um, RESPs, I think Krista touched on that really quickly. Um, I think the main, the main thing there is with uh, saving for, for your child's education is, is attaining the federal grant. And it's a 20% grant from the government up to $500 per year per child. Parents and grandparents even can set up these family or individual RESP trusts uh, for, their, 
for the children of our fisheries and, and attain something to the neighbor of 7,200 lifetime federal grant. So again, with a tax deferred investment uh, that they can set up in that trust. We all contribute pretty much to Canada Pension Plan. Uh, and the earliest you can take that is age 60, the normal age is 65, and you can defer it as age, uh, to age 70. You are incentivized to defer it, but of course, the timing at which to take it is, is really dependent upon your personal plan and your health uh, and your other uh, resources that you've built. Great. Thank you very much, James. Uh, Carissa, I'd like you to respond as well to this question. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. And you know, James and Archie went into a lot of detail uh, around the financial planning process per se. And then James did uh, a really good in-depth look at some of the programs. And what I would say is, you know, remember that the journey to financial independence and wealth accumulation is in steps. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one day. Um, it is a journey. So there's, uh, and nothing is going to get you know, the, the whole picture isn't going to be painted in one setting. And so uh, what I want to encourage all, all of the listeners to, to really think about is the financial plan and revisiting it. As I mentioned, minimum every year is what is what you'd want to. Um, that's how you, know, you will stay close to a lot of these concepts that Jim and Archie uh, mentioned. Like for example, if you're planning for retirement, you want to be able to visualize, even if you're in your 30s, even if you know you're in your you know 20s, let's just say retirement may not be the first thing on your mind, but it's really important to have a, a, a vision of what that'll look like. So for example, if if you're in your 30s or you know approaching your 40s, it's important to say like today with 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 what I have and what I've accumulated. You know, like Archie mentioned, if you're fortunate to have, you know, a pension plan with your work, you know, what does that total income, what does that look like today? What does that look like 20, 30 years from now? And it'll start to, to get you really comfortable and confident and an understanding of, okay, well, in retirement, even though it's 30 years away, 20 years away, however long, um, you know, this is what it looks like. This is right now what my pension looks like. This is how much I have saved. Uh, this is how much the government is going to provide me from working from, you know, Canada Pension Plan, et cetera. So at least you start to see that. And then at least, you know, you, you'll start to see the growth. So uh, my recommendation is really to ensure that if you do, if you have not seen this picture painted for you, and again, the picture will evolve and change over time, um, I encourage you to, to do so because seeing it, it, uh, come to life and seeing that picture painted specifically for your situation um, is, is really incredible. And it's a really, like I mentioned, it, it'll make you feel really comfortable. It'll make you feel more confident and more interested in doing all the things that we talked about, you know, setting a, a vision board for goals, talking about those goals, engaging an expert, uh, all of these things. So um, I'll end there. Thanks, John. Oh, that's, that's absolutely perfect. Is there I guess I want to ask a question of everybody. I mean, is there, I mean, there are people from all different walks of life. There are students who are just graduating from university that are people in their sort of, you know, mid career, if you will. Uh, and there are people close to retirement. Is there any, anything specific that you might advise a general audience as to when might be just a great time to start thinking about saving for your retirement? And, and I asked the question really from the perspective that if we look at the statistics, many people don't start thinking about this until they're about five or 10 years out from retirement. Now, now John, I'll just, I'll just say quickly too, in my own experience, I've been with CIBC for almost 20 years. And uh, when I started my, my, my first job um, with, with the organization, I remember a, a colleague which retired a year and a half later that I started, she said, just start investing, just start putting away, even if it's $25 a month, $50 a month, whatever you can afford, uh, do it. So and at earlier, I think James was talking about it and Archie as well is looking, revisiting your cash flow, saying, you know, what can I afford? You know, what can 
what can I maybe take, take out of, you know, my day to day? Do I really need that $6 coffee? Can I, you know, drop it down to $2 a day and it, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, just really save, uh, put some money away, whatever you can. And the earlier, the better start today. Uh, that would be my advice because what happens is you learn to live without it. And then uh, as well, you'll uh, years later, you'll say, wow, you know, I have a nice, you know, nest egg that I've created again, you'll feel great about it you'll want to continue it and it's it's uh it's like you know you know when you focus and you're determined on 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 those goals uh it's really incredible to see them come to life yeah i think that's that's very good advice um uh, the learning to live without it aspect um it sounds so absolute but really i think what ultimately one is doing is deferring that want into the future in order to arrive at whatever goal they need to arrive at at some point in the future. I think that's really, really good advice. Thanks for that, Carissa. Um, I will invite actually Marie Muldowney uh, back into the fold here as I have a question for her at this point. Hello, Marie. So we have a question here for you. Why is it important to speak to a qualified financial professional? Well, I would say through the whole um, session we've had today, I think it's it's been underlined many times why it is important to have a financial advisor with you. If you step back for a moment and you think, if I don't plan for anything, then I don't really know where I'm going and I don't know if I've gotten there. And you, we all have goals and objectives that we have. You really put them down as, as Carissa said, then you really need someone to help you with that advice. Think about when you go for a, on a trip. So you go to travel, you plan out how you're going to go, how you're going to get there, where you're going to stay, what you're going to see. There's a lot of planning goes into just a trip. That's maybe a one or two week, 10 day adventure. Imagine your retirement. You might be in retirement for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. And you need to plan for that too. It's a really important step. So Carissa talked about the importance of goals and how important they are. And James, I think, pointed out, as did Archie, you know, the complexity of financial information and financial products and services. Archie presented a rather daunting list of vehicles that you can use in your in your planning. So as, as everyone said, it takes discipline and commitment. But if for this journey as well, as, as Carissa said, I think you need an advisor, somebody that can help you. And every financial institution with all their myriad of products and services have financial advisors, financial planners on staff that can help. And they can answer your questions about the complexity of of the financial instruments you have available to you. Just think about it. If you get a travel brochure in the mail, you probably look at it with quite a bit of interest. If you got that prospectus in the mail, how many of you read it? How many of you understood it? How many knew what it said to you? How many knew where to find the fees? So these are all, these are all parts of your financial plan that your financial advisor can help you with. So we highly recommend you have a financial advisor. There is regulation in Canada, certainly regulation in Ontario coming for financial advisors and financial planners. Quebec already has financial financial planning legislation in place. But I would say every financial institution puts a lot of stock in, in preparing their staff to be financial planners and financial advisors. So we highly recommend that you get a financial planner, a financial advisor to help you through the journey. Back to you, John. Thank you, Marie. We're at about uh, 10 minutes to the hour and we have a number of questions here from, uh, from our attendees. So I will just, uh, I will ask the question of all of the panelists, uh, not necessarily individually, just please feel free to jump in to respond. Although this first question I will Uh, First, direct to Archie, because uh, you brought it up earlier, and this is on the 50-30-20 principle again. There's a number of questions around this, which I find quite interesting. Um, And the question is really around where do mortgages, car loans, and student loans fit in to this 50-30-20 principle? Right. Yeah. So, you know, really it's, um, I, I just would say with, we all need a car normally if we're driving, but if, I mean, if you're living downtown, obviously you can take public transit, but um, 
I guess when it comes to, so you're saying debt management would be part of the 20% that I mentioned. I mean, it's a, it's a general rule, but it doesn't necessarily mean to have to be the rule that applies to the individual. Mm. I just say that, you know, given the cost of housing, for instance, today, um, you might find that a, a larger portion of that 20% ends up representing mortgage payments because, um, you know, homes are definitely more expensive if we look at the GTA or Vancouver. So, you know, when it comes to affordability and paying that, you know, you just have to make sure that you're in a position that you can actually handle that mortgage debt um, because it might represent a larger portion of the pie that you're actually having to put forward. And that's why it's so, uh, you have to be so cognizant of your discretionary items. So not buying a car that's too expensive for you. Um, not, you know, getting into a situation where your monthly payments on cars is, is out of whack in terms of the budget that you have available. I always find, you know, the savings piece is really the crucial part. You really need to pay yourself first and make sure that you dedicate that money towards retirement because there's going to be at some point in the future that you're not going to be able to work, whether that's because your health changes or because you're at a point where, you know, you just don't feel like working anymore. Um, and so that's why we need to start setting money aside every month um, towards that dedicated savings goal and try to try to mitigate some of the other luxury items until later, until we actually have the wealth to, to buy those items. Makes sense. James, any response to that question? The question was specific to where do like consumer debts fit into the planning pyramid? With regards to the 50, 30, 20 rule, where would mortgages, car loans, and student loans fit into that equation? The concern was that by leaving these in the 20% category, there would be almost nothing left to go into savings. Mm. Well, again, when we, when we do, I think Chris had talked about it right off the top about, you know, optimizing or assessing cash flow. So when we're, when we're doing cash flow planning with clients, we're, we're assessing their current situation and what, uh, what consumer financing they may have in place, whether it be mortgage or lines of credit or, or vehicle financing, et cetera, student loan. And we have to come up with a holistic strategy that deals with all of it. I mean, we can't, we can't necessarily just do all the savings and neglect uh, accelerated debt repayment. Um, there has to be some kind of balance point to, to the strategy, I believe. And I'm pretty debt, debt averse um, myself. And so, um, you know, we're, we're definitely directing dollars in some kind of reasonable way towards uh, accelerated debt repayment. Um, it, it becomes one of the controllable priorities in your financial planning pyramid for sure. Um, I do hear the argument or the dilemma that, you know, should I, should I save more with, with these markets or should I use my capital to, to reduce debt faster with lower interest rate? I don't know. It's the, the mathematical argument or the logical argument is often used with me, which is to, well, if interest rates are so low, why should I, why should I do it? And why should I accelerate my debt repayment at this time? And counterintuitively, I would pose the question to the client and ask them, you know, well, with interest rates so low, isn't it now the time to hit your capital of your debt uh, faster? On, again, on some balanced uh, ratio, you know, I call it kind of a dealing with your defense and, and, and of course the savings is kind of dealing with more of your offense. So yeah, that's what I would say about that. Okay, great. Carissa, do you have a view on that? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just to add, I mean, the one thing to remember specifically with mortgage payments and, and James uh, mentioned something really important as well. Like, you know, when interest rates are low, it's when you could take advantage of paying uh, down your capital, but also remember that when you're paying down your capital, you're all, you're also contributing to your net worth. So you're paying down your mortgage, you own that property that is yours. That's your asset. So um, you know, that's specific to, to, to mortgage payments. Uh, I would say there's going to be times uh, within your life cycle that it's going to be, you know, a little tougher to save and other times where you're like, you know, I have, you know, a little bit more to save. Don't get discouraged depending on situations. And again, I, I, I go back to what we're all dealing with this year with COVID-19. This is a very tough year for many of us uh, because it may have impacted our savings. It may, some people, you know, may have uh, decreased income, lost income, changing jobs, all of that. So this time is an example of when somebody can get discouraged and say, well, 
you know, I, I can't save that extra hundred dollars or fifty dollars a month that I could have. Now I have to put that on hold. But the important thing is to when you get back back on track, and and the majority of us will, is okay. Let's revisit that. Now I'm revisiting my cash flow again. Things are back on track. I'm going to now put that fifty hundred dollars back. So that that's a very important piece. Is number one, like don't get discouraged. There's going to be times where you're going to save a little more, save a little less. But always make sure when you when when you're feeling back on track that you're 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 resetting that savings goal because you always would want to do you know a little bit of both you would you'd want to you know pay uh, pay down your debt but you know you always want to look at opportunities to save now again that depends on what type of debt you have it depends on the interest rates all of that but um, but you always want to look at opportunities to save for your future and you also also want to always look at opportunities to pay down your debt especially the the, the highest interest. Um, components of debt. Thanks for that, Carissa. Uh, I've got an, another question here, which I thought was kind of an interesting question, and, and uh, I'd like to see how you all respond to it. Um, it, it it's got a couple, of, a couple of components to it. So we have an individual here who has a fixed pool of money. They're currently employed, and they have a couple of options. They can either invest their money for the long term, or use those funds to get a better education with the idea that someday they may be able to get a job, a, a better job, if you will. So from an investing standpoint, the question is, am I better to invest in markets or whatever, or whatever investment vehicles, you know, make sense for me from, from a retirement standpoint, given that I'm currently employed, or am I better to invest in myself via an education? So it's an interesting question. I thought I'd just put that out to everybody and uh, see what uh, see what see how you respond to that. I'll start with uh, you know I always look at education as being a very positive investment. Um, of course, I I don't know the person's in particular situation. Mm -hmm. I always say like when I'm dealing with clients and doing wealth plans, I like to know all the details around their financial situation before making a recommendation. But I would just say that any you know, if you're going to do your MBA or anything like that, it's, it's a career advancement opportunity. You know, it might be a large sum of money, but you know, if, if, you know, education is definitely up there in terms of uh, growing your wealth in time, because hopefully the income will follow later uh, with that higher education. Thank you, Archie. James, any, uh, any short response to that? Sure. Um, it sounds like the, 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 the person that asked the question, um, thanks for the question, by the way is someone who believes in continuous learning. And that's, again, that's a, that's a favorable attribute. And, uh, you know, with clients, I think I would say, you know, that's an investment in your human capital and your human capital will over time, uh, you know, you'll have this phase of life where you have higher amounts of human, human capital and um, you'll want to translate that into wealth over time. So <clears throat> I think the greatest investments I've ever seen uh, from a return on capital perspective actually have been into growing your, your professional development, growing, uh, growing as a person, um, uh, getting credentials, accreditations, advancing in your career, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's almost hard to define in you know, financial terms, you know, the success of that investment, but because you're kind of putting that dollar forward into the future um, in, in kind of good faith. But I think with discipline and with your own accountability towards that end, uh, you're going to win. It's, it's a, it's a victory play, you know, um, you know, you might get six, seven, eight, nine percent in your investment portfolio. Fantastic. And, and that will, that will double over a short period of time. But, but the investments that you make into yourself are just, you know, the magnitude of return can be phenomenal. So I would echo, uh, I would echo that. Great. Great. We've got about two minutes left and I'm going to give Carissa last word on this one. Yeah, that's a, this is a, a really good question. And, and I would say, you know, go back to that vision board that I was speaking about earlier or writing down a list. Like if your true passion is to become, you know, a certain, you know, uh, role in a profession uh, or it is to better yourself, like there, there is, you know, there's nothing greater than, than bettering yourself. Um, but again, I, I think you really have to think about what is most important to you at the time uh write a uh, do a vision board write it out 
what is the uh, Archie talked about um, the opportunity for future income. So you know what what role, what job, what career are you in, the, in now? Uh, is that making you satisfied? What is the growth in income that you could achieve from that versus you know investing in yourself in education because that will usually pay you back. Um, it's very important to save for the future. I'm a very big advocate of saving as early as possible. Um, but you know if 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 your decision is to go for the education route, um, then you want to, uh, you know, quickly say, you know, how can I start to save again? And even if it is through regular investment plans, like we talked about, uh, to get you there, um, uh, again, it is a personal choice. It is really to sit down and think about what could happen and where where could I go as opposed to where where I am now. So uh, I would say really sit down and 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 know uh, that that's a personal feeling, and uh, and where where the future will take you. That's perfect, Carissa. Thank you very, very much. We're at the top of the hour here. I'd like to thank all of the panelists and all of the attendees. Uh, it was uh, it was my pleasure to be a part of this uh, webinar today. On that note, I will hand it back to Marie. Great. Thank you, John. We're up at the top of the hour, and this concludes our webinar. So thanks to uh, Carissa, James, Archie, and uh, John for hosting. Uh, we have one more webinar planned in our series for Financial Literacy Month. It's on November 24th, and it's called Preventing and uh, Protecting Against Fraud and Financial Abuse. If you have additional questions, please email us at designations at csi.ca. A replay of this event will be available in the coming days on the CSI website. So thank you for joining, and I wish you a great rest of day.